tonight's Telenet. Um, before we do, just a few housekeeping things. Um, hopefully you should all see my screen here um, with our first slide that shows a little bit of the technical aspects of um, participating in tonight's presentation. So um, if you haven't been able to mute your microphone or your phone, I'm going to go ahead and mute all participants just to make sure that um, everybody can hear us and we don't have a little, you know, any kind of interference going on in the background. It can get a little bit distracting. Um, other than that, uh, I th it looks like everyone um, is on and let's see if we can get everyone muted here. Oh, let's see here. Alrighty. Well, we'll go ahead and move through our slides. So welcome again to tonight's Four Seasons Gardening Telenet. Tonight's webinar is called Edimentals, Adding Color and Variety to Your Garden and Diet. I am Leah Kedem. I am a, um, a nutrition and wellness educator and registered dietitian with UVI Extension. I'm based in Champaign, so I am calling from uh, my home in Urbana, but you know, it's the great thing about technology, we can do this kind of thing anywhere. And Diane Pleva, um, Diane, you on? You want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Diane Pleva. I'm a plant diagnostic outreach specialist at the University of Illinois Plant Clinic, um, but previous to this, I was a horticulture educator in Unit 13. That's right. So she was also in Champaign and um, a colleague of mine, and lucky enough that I can still uh, <laughs> interact with Diane and do this kind of stuff. So um, we're really excited to um, share tonight's presentation with you, um, bringing the best of chemistry and science to explain some of the color and, um, and variety behind new fruits and vegetables, and talking a little bit about some of the uh, health effects of these fruits and vegetables. So what's going to happen is I'm going to go through my presentation first, my portion, and talk about some of the, um, the chemical names of the, um, the compounds that give fruits and vegetables their color, um, some of the research that's going on looking at health effects, and then Diane is going to talk a little bit more about um, how you can actually grow these and um, a little bit more about the reasons why some of these colors develop. So to start off, where do the colors come from? And I'm going to go through this kind of um, by rainbow, so starting with red and moving um, you know, more towards the other side of the spectrum. So these pigmented phytochemicals, as we call them, you know, plant chemicals, a lot of our root words come from the Greek. So anthocyanins um, is our first one that we're going to talk about, and that covers the spectrum from red and purples, of course, which is a mixture of red and blue, to, you know, those colors that are more on the blue side. Um, related chemically, but giving different colors, are anthoxanthins. Okay, and again, we're going to go through each of these one by one. I'm just giving a quick overview here. So anthoxanthins range in color from kind of the brighter yellows to kind of a paler, um, a paler yellow that you, for me, I associate with like baby chicks, <laughs> um, to white. You know, really, really, really light yellow to the point of being white. Okay, um, then we have another class of compounds called beta-lanes, and they're similar in color to the carotene and carotenoid family, but they're very distinct. They're not actually chemically related at all, but they do give the same colors. And then, of, co of course, we have chlorophyll. Um, everybody knows our green chlorophyll, and, and we'll talk a little bit about um, the health benefits behind that. Believe it or not, chlorophyll does have some health benefits. So, but again, talking with, um, talking about the anthocyanins, starting with our reds and blues and purples. So anthocyanins, uh, on the top right-hand corner here, you can see the chemical structure, and it's got um, this ring structure that's very characteristic, and lots of side chains that go off there, but they all have that characteristic ring structure, okay? And these are responsible for giving the red, 
and blue colors that we see in berries in particular. They're um, most known for being in blueberries and raspberries and strawberries, um, but also to some degree cherries and, and grapes, so like uh, Concord grapes, purple, and you know those really dark, almost black grapes um, get their color from anthocyanins. And the shade varies according to pH or acidity. So if a, if a berry or a fruit has more of a reddish color, that's indicating that there's a more acidic environment. And it doesn't translate necessarily into acidic flavor or um, you know ability to, to burn or anything like that. It really has more to do with, um, we're talking about acidity in terms of chemistry. Okay, um, some of the health effects that research is looking at associating anthocyanins with um, inflammation or decreasing inflammation, um, decreasing pain. So um, something that is recommended sometimes for athletes is to drink tart cherry juice since it's particularly high in these anthocyanins, which can have this, um, this effect of mitigating pain. Um, another research aspect is looking at uh, brain health. So anthocyanins are antioxidants, so they can play a role in maintaining proper brain health and also heart health as well um, by preventing a lot of that, again, inflammation and um, taking care of some of those free radicals that cause damage. So another compound that gives red color um, it's something called lycopene, and lycopene is actually a type of carotene, so it's a form of vitamin A. It's a less active form of vitamin A. It doesn't, um, you know, do what vitamin A does for our eyesight, but it has its own, um, its own health effects as well. So research is looking at um, particularly lycopene's role in cancer, preventing cancer. So um, there's been a lot of studies looking at the link between eating tomato products, tomatoes which are particularly high in lycopene, um, and prostate cancer. So uh, skin cancer as well. Um, just a, a note, lycopene is kind of interesting because its availability um, and the amount that's actually present in the plant increases the riper the, the fruit or vegetable gets. And also, because it's, it's fat soluble, so you want to be consuming um, vitamin A and you know, uh, carotenoid, carotene related compounds with a source of fat. So that's why a lot of times it's really nice to have like tomato sauce with cheese, you know, pasta marinara with cheese, or, um, or some olive oil with your tomatoes. That's a really nice way to make sure you're absorbing all of the lycopene that you can. Um, something else that's unique about lycopene is that it's better absorbed when cooked. So um, when you cook it, the heat actually changes the chemical structure, and that makes it easier for our bodies to absorb. And I, I apologize if you hear a dog barking. That's mine. <laughs> So other than tomatoes, actually watermelon, um, kind of our traditional red watermelon is quite high in lycopene. Um, a question, we, we presented this webinar on Tuesday as well, and a question came up. Someone wanted to know if yellow watermelon was also high in lycopene, but actually um, the amount is very minimal. So you've got to look for that red color. That's going to be um, a hallmark for foods like tomatoes. So yeah, they're varieties of yellow tomatoes and orange tomatoes, which will still have some lycopene, but not quite as much as the red ones. So talking more about those orange and yellow fruits and veggies, of course, I think we all know beta carotene. We associate that with carrots, OK? Carotene and carrot, they go along with that orange color. And beta carotene is really the, the longer chemical name for vitamin A, OK? Out of the compounds we're going to talk about tonight, this is the only one that actually has vitamin activity, meaning nutritional value. 
And by that, I mean it's the only one that we actually require for human health, for proper eyesight. You know, vitamin A is essential for all sorts of functions in our bodies other than eyesight, so growth and development, maintaining our immune system. Um, the other ones, again, they're they kind of work like antioxidants, and they're these phytochemicals, but they don't, they're not required by our bodies for proper health. But, of course, getting them may confer some health benefits upon us. So um, vitamin A, again, you can see it's related. It's very similar to the lycopene. So I'm just going to um, scroll back here real quick so you can kind of see that top right corner to see the chemical structure, you can see how similar they are. So back here, lycopene, you've got that long kind of, you've got a long chain with these ring-like structures on either end. And you can see, again, it's very similar um, for the beta carotene. So again, they're related in chemical uh, structure. Now, um, something to note, that beta carotene a lot of times can be masked in fruits and vegetables, you may not actually see that orange color. Um, and that's because chlorophyll actually covers it up. So you see that green color, things like spinach and, um, and kale, they're known for their, of course, dark green color, but they're actually excellent sources of beta carotene. So, you know, looks can be deceiving, but of course, other than, um, than those, carrots we all know, but squashes like um, butternut squash, acorn squash, which is, you know, a lighter yellow, um, pumpkin, of course, these are all excellent sources of beta carotene. And of course, the fruits and vegetables that are pictured and the ones that I'm talking about are really, it's not um, limited to the ones that we're discussing, but those are probably the best known and also the best sources in terms of um, actual content how much they have. All right, so another type of carotene pigment, you can see, again, the chemical structure is pretty similar. Um, these are called xanthophylls, and they also give orange and yellow color. Um, it's not a fruit or a vegetable, but egg yolks are very high in lutein and zeaxanthin compared to other foods. Um, to address the question that popped up in the chat box here, yes, sweet, sweet potatoes are exceptionally high in beta carotene. Yes, they do get their, um, their orange color from the beta carotene. So they're great. Um, <clears throat> so these, um, so xanthophylls are actually associated with better eyesight. Okay, of course, carotene, beta carotene itself, we know. That has to do more with the structure of the eye and the, the chemical reactions that have to happen for us to be able to see. But um, xanthophylls work a little bit differently in, again, we don't require these for health, but they can protect our vision by neutralizing some of the high energy blue light and you know UV rays that we come into contact with every day when we go outside and it's bright out. So um, foods again like egg yolks, um, they're also found in of course peaches, nectarines, um, papaya and passion fruit are good sources as well. So eating a lot of these kinds of foods can help prevent cataracts and um, potentially macular degeneration. You, you'll probably see lutein and zeaxanthin listed a lot of times on, um, on supplements that are marketed as um, either being for older adults or, you know, for, for eye health. You may have heard these words before. So moving along to a completely unrelated class of compounds, you can see that chemical structure in the top right-hand corner is very different. So um, these are coming from foods like beets and Swiss chard, um, and they're called beta lanes. And of course, beta lanes, we have to have our, we have to have our subcategories <laughs> again. We have beta cyanins, and again, look for that root word, the cyan, that's indicating that it's like a reddish, bluish purple tint, and then beta xanthins, xanth, um, remember, so far we've had xanthophylls, and those have been yellow and orange, so you would rightly, um, you would rightly guess that these are going to be more on the yellow side, which is um, why we see yellow beets 
and of course the yellow varieties of chard that have the um, the ends are going to have that yellow hue. So remember, these are actually not related at all to anthocyanins and anthoxanthins um, or or carotene compounds at all, um, but. They uh, may have anti-inflammatory properties, so there's um, some research going on looking at beta lanes and whether or not um, you know they may be able to be used in medical practice or you know over the counter or even in, you know in supplements. You may be able to already f to um, you may be able to find supplements on the market already that um, that have these types of things, um, but. You know, we don't know a whole lot about it just yet. I wouldn't run out to the nearest store and stock up on supplements and or drink tons of beet juice or just, you know, down tons of beets and chard just because. <laughs> um, beta lanes are interesting. If you eat too much of it, too much of foods containing these at one time, they can turn your urine red, which can be quite alarming if you weren't expecting that. So, you know, you might freak out and think, oh my god, you know, something's going on with my kidneys, and I mean, something is going on, they're uh, pumping out all that extra um, beta lane. So, uh, they are clearly, they're water soluble. <laughs> but again, don't go out and go crazy on these. We're going to talk a little bit more about, um, you know, what happens when we get too much of these things later. All right, so um, more along the lines of yellow and white, so or very, very, very pale yellow, um, are these anthoxanthin compounds. And if you recall, that ring structure was um, in our anthocyanin compounds, so this is similar. They are related in chemical structure. Um, common food sources, things you might not think of necessarily as healthy, um, they get kind of a bad rap, really starchy foods like bananas and potatoes. Uh, a lot of times people think that the absence of color uh, means that a food isn't nutritious or that it's bad for us, and that's really not true. Um, bananas and potatoes are great fruits and vegetables to to eat. They have a lot of nutrition content also other than um, starch. <laughs> so, you know, I'm rooting for the potato. Um, you know, a lot of people don't realize there's a lot of good nutrition in there. So um, they also get their kind of pale yellow colors from these anthoxanthins, which may actually uh, be helpful for heart health and potentially stomach cancer. There's been some research looking at anthoxanthins with these ailments, and it might make a little bit of sense when you think about um, the fact that like onions and garlic have high amounts of these anthoxanthins, and a lot of times you hear about like taking garlic supplements for your heart, for um, blood pressure, um, you know, kind of these these stinky fruits and vegetables, as I like to call them, the stinky ones, um, the ones that have these sulfuric compounds. It's not the sulfur that has anything to do with this, but they're kind of that's a characteristic of them. So, like cruciferous vegetables, like broccoli and um, cauliflower, again, stinky onions and, and garlic, they have these anthoxanthins that might um, be helpful in uh, staving off some of these chronic diseases. promised I'd get to chlorophyll, and of course we all know without chlorophyll we would have no plants. We need it for photosynthesis. Um, so chlorophyll, of course, is in all plant leaves and stems, um, and of course green leafy vegetables. Um, something I want to note <clears throat> that chlorophyll actually does not have any real antioxidant activity, but I wanted to mention it because, of course, it, of course for the green color, but also because it it does have nutritional benefit to us um, because at the center of each chlorophyll molecule is um, a magnesium. And we do need magnesium for regulating our blood pressure and our, our heartbeat, uh, maintaining our heart rhythms. And magnesium is also very important for bone health. And we don't think about that a lot. You may not have even heard about <laughs> magnesium and bone health together. Usually it's going to be calcium or vitamin D, but actually magnesium is essential for um, maintaining the structure and, and integrity of our bones. So 
chlorophyll. You can eat your greens and know that you're doing you're doing good by your bones and and your heart as well. So, these pigments a lot of times can be masters of disguise, and then they can kind of mess with our cooking and kind of some of the results that we're wanting to get. What happens when we actually cook these fruits and vegetables that contain um, these pigmented phytochemicals? Anthocyanins, of course, remember going back to those reds and blues and purples, what happens is cooking, the heat makes cells expand. Heat makes most um, most things expand, right? And ultimately, when we cook them too long, they can burst. What happens is the pigments leach out into the water since they are water soluble. And unfortunately, the color of the fruit or the vegetable will fade. Um, and as it go, as those pigments kind of leach out into the water, the water will be tinted either you know, pink or purple <laughs> or blue. It can be kind of interesting. Um, and also, you can get to the point that the color may even change completely. So it may revert to a different form of anthocyanin and actually present with a different color. OK, so these are very sensitive to pH changes, again, or ac acidity, or lack of acidity, which we would call um, being more basic. So on the left side here, we have our red, the deeper red we have that means um, the more acidic. And then kind of middle of the road is blue and that's, you know, it's not completely basic or not acidic, but it's definitely more towards the basic side compared to the reds, okay? Um, and then if you get to the point where you add lots and lots of base um, in the form of maybe like baking soda, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about cooking sources of um, acids and bases. You can actually turn things green and, and even to yellow, which for the most part we probably don't want to be doing. Number one, because we changed the structure um, to the point where it may not have the antioxidant activity anymore. And also it's it's going to look kind of weird. <laughs> we eat with our eyes first and, you know, sometimes um, that can be desirable to have kind of a funky colored fruit or vegetable, but a lot of times that's not really what we're looking for. Okay. So um, just a, an example where a cooking ingredient might be used to maintain the integrity of the color. Um, very common to see when you're cooking like red cabbage. Most recipes will include some sort of acid like vinegar um, or lemon juice, something like that, so that we're making the, um, the environment more acidic so that we maintain that red color. We maintain the anthocyanins. We don't want them to be changing to, um, to a different compound. Anthoxanthins, remember these are yellow and white, but they are, they are related um, in chemical structure to anthocyanins, and they are also sensitive to pH, okay? Um, prolonged cooking is going to darken and dull their color um, to the point where, remember I mentioned that if you overcook foods with anthocyanins, they can change colors, so can anthoxanthins. Uh, a very typical reaction that we'll see is if you overcook foods like um, cauliflower, which is a really good example of something that has those anthoxanthins. Um, it can get to the point where they will change structure completely and turn pink. So uh, pink cauliflower, not something you might be expecting <laughs> uh, for, you know, for a little girl. It might be cool. It might be a good way to encourage her to eat some cauliflower. But again, that's we're going to be losing some of that. Um, we may be losing the integrity of the antioxidant and um, not the prettiest thing, not something we're looking for. Okay, so here's an example with cooking. Um, on the left side, we've got our piece of cauliflower that um, was cooked with a little bit of um, vinegar. Okay, there's a little bit of vinegar added to the cooking water. And it's this really bright color. Again, that acid helped preserve that. 
Um, and then on the right, we've got our piece of cauliflower that was cooked with a little bit of baking soda, which is a base, and it turns it kind of this weird yellow color that's really not very attractive. So very interesting to see how the ingredients we use can actually change the color of fruits and vegetables. All right, chlorophyll is also sensitive to cooking, okay, um, and also to pH. So what happens? Um, if we add a lot of heat, we apply a lot of heat to um, certain foods that contain chlorophyll, they can change the color from that nice, vibrant green to really more of a, an olive color, kind of a dull green. And that's very common, you'll see, with like canned peas and canned green beans. Um, that's why that happens. The, uh, the, uh, the prolonged heat is going to change the chlorophyll to this compound called pheophyton, which has that characteristic olive color. On the other hand, um, and also this, this also happens when we add acid, okay? So um, in this case, acid is not a good thing. Exposure to base, okay, so if we're going to add a little bit of baking soda here, it's actually going to brighten the green color. So that's going to um, transform the chlorophyll to something called chlorophyllin, which has um, a very bright green color. It might not taste good um, if you use too much, <laughs> so you got to use um, a light hand with that, but it can um, preserve that green color, and a lot of times that's why you might see listed on the ingredients um, of canned vegetables, you might see a little bit of baking soda in there. To look at the, um, let's see here, there's a question in the comments, the yellow, I said that the yellow and white foods were more basic. Why would you add vinegar or lemon juice to them? That'll make them more acidic instead of basic. So let me go back to these slides. Okay, so yellow and white, so that, no. So we're kind of confusing what happens with um, anthocyanins and anthoxanthins. Okay, so these are our, let's see here, here we go. These are used as pH indicators, okay, so um, they turn red. It just so happens that red fruits and vegetables with the um, anthocyanins, they happen to be red, okay, and they're more acidic. So going back here, anthoxanthins, um, you know, I'm not sure about how particularly acidic these, or acidic or basic, these foods are. Um, but when you add acid, it preserves the white color. I'm not exactly sure why. I'm not a chemist. But um, the point is that in cooking, we can use some of our ingredients to preserve the colors that we want and um, prevent kind of these discolorations that make foods not so appealing. We can come back to that in a little bit. I want to make sure that we have time for Diane's part of the presentation. Um, so of course we have lots of rainbow colored fruits and vegetables, um, either because they've been, uh, you know, hybridized to make them turn out different colors or just less, uh, less commonly seen fruits and vegetables like kind of yellow beets and, and yellow watermelon. Of course, bell peppers can come in all sorts of different colors, which depends more on the stage of ripening. Um, I think my favorite has got to be these bluish purple potatoes, which is probably why I put them front and center. They're just so pretty. So again, how do we cook for color and preserve the ones that we want? Acids that we use in cooking are going to be things like lemon juice, cream of tartar is another one, and vinegar, as I mentioned previously. Um, when we're cooking foods that are, um, that are more white, they are getting those color, well, I guess lack of color <laughs> from anthoxanthins, and we, assuming we would want to preserve that, we can add a little bit of lemon juice or cream of tartar vinegar to, again, preserve that, prevent that from darkening 
and getting more gray or yellow. Okay, uh, same thing with red foods that are getting their red color from anthocyanins. I'm not talking about um, foods that would get red color from beta lanes. Those, um, and the reason why we're not really talking about those is because those those colored pigments are not sensitive at all. They aren't really going to change color with heat or with pH. Okay, um, chlorophyll acid is going to dull that color. Remember, make it into pheophyton, which is that olive color. It's not the prettiest thing to look at. Um, so what we want to do is we're going to want to go to the opposite side and enhance that. Usually, we're going to want to enhance green color. I can't think of an example where anyone would want <laughs> to dull the green and um, make pheophyton. So we're going to want to add a little bit of base to go the other way. Um, something else to mention with cooking is that acid actually can firm texture and thereby increase the cooking time. Okay, it can take longer to cook something. So if you're doing something like, um, well, I don't know, maybe for some reason you want to firm up the texture, maybe some vegetables, you don't like them real mushy, again, you can add a little bit of acid to do that. Um, for base, Okay, basic ingredients that we might typically use would be like baking soda, baking powder. Calcium carbonate isn't really um, a cooking ingredient, but it's responsible for um, making hard water. Okay, so hard water itself actually can be basic and cause some of these changes. So if you've been seeing some of these things happen um, and you haven't been doing it intentionally, it could be possible that you have hard water. And that's not, it's not a, you know, a thing you can't fix. Again, you can go the other way by using some of the more acidic ingredients to counteract the, um, the base. All right, so with, uh, with base, it's going to turn anthoxanthins more to that yellow color, more on the yellow side of the spectrum. Um, for blue, it's going to turn anthocyanins more blue. And then green, which is actually a good thing. Um, usually base is not going to be good, but in the case of chlorophyll, yes, it's going to enhance that nice green color and make it more vibrant, change it to chlorophyllin. Now, um, as acid firm texture, base actually softens texture and can decrease your cooking time. So it'll make things cook faster. So that's why you may see um, when an ingredient or in recipes where you're using dry beans as an ingredient, you're cooking dry beans, why you may be asked to add a little bit of baking soda or baking powder because that's actually going to speed up the cooking time. But you got to be careful that you don't overdo it. Okay. So just to put it all together, an example, if you have hard water and your cauliflower turns yellow because of that, we're going to add a little, bit, a little bit of acid to turn it um, the pH of the water and therefore the vegetable, you know, it's going to absorb some of that water while it's cooking. Um, so we're going to add acid to preserve some of that white color. And you could do this with cream of tartar or a little bit of vinegar or lemon juice. Okay, so um, this is again just kind of a summary slide. Something I wanted to mention at the bottom here in particular, um, our cookware also plays a role in um, either maintaining or maintaining the color or actually changing the color. So make sure that if you're wanting to preserve the color, stay away from using aluminum um, or iron cookware since they can um, react with some of the colorful compounds and cause them to discolor. But also at the same time, um, you can actually end up discoloring your cookware, um, either from the compounds interacting with, with each other or because of some of the acid that's in the food, aluminum, and um, I think aluminum is less likely to be affected by it, but iron cookware, you know, like an ironclad uh, skillet, you don't want to cook tomatoes in it because it can, um, it can damage the cookware.
So to answer some questions about the health effects, you know, what should I eat? Is are purple carrots healthier than orange carrots? Are you know sweet potatoes better than regular potatoes? And are they different in terms of nutrition? So the difference really is in terms of antioxidant content. Um, it's not these food are the foods are not going to be different in terms of calorie, fat, um, carbohydrates, or protein. Okay. Um, the one exception is if we have an orange variety um, that n normally would be a different color, and the orange color is being um, is coming from beta carotene, then yes. Um, you're going to be getting more vitamin A than you might otherwise. And, you know, whether that's a good thing or not, um, it depends on what all else you're eating um, in your diet throughout the day and also just um, as your dietary patterns in general. I mean, if you tend to fall short on vitamin A and eating orange cauliflower is a way for you to, to reach your limit, then, hey, I'm all for that. But um, typically we don't have a problem with getting vitamin A just because, you know, we tend to eat a lot of carrots in this country, and also um, vitamin A is found in a lot of other foods as well. Um, a lot of dairy products are um, are fortified with vitamin A. So milk, a lot of times you'll see um, on the label will say vitamin A and vitamin D milk. So, you know, vitamin A is not really a new train of concern for Americans, but, you know, a little more may not hurt you. Uh, skin versus the flesh, the color of the skin, if it's different than the color of the flesh, then they're going to have different antioxidants in there. They're going to have different phytochemicals. So, of course, I say eat both if possible, so you reap the benefits of eating the entire uh, fruit or vegetable. Um, also, I also recommend eating the skin as much as you can, uh, just because there's a lot of um, insoluble fiber in the skin that can help keep you regular and you know just keep your digestive system um, moving along and um, and it actually may be um, associated with a lower risk of colorectal cancer so I know some people can't eat skins of fruits and vegetables uh, depending on their digestive health so if that's the case then you know don't listen to what I'm saying always rely on your doctor uh, your you know your medical professional for personalized advice, but in general, Americans should be getting more fiber from um, from these sources, so I recommend it. But of course, it, there's always too much of a good thing, right? So a really good example of this uh, that you might see is something called keratinemia, and it is possible if you eat too much um, you can get too many uh, foods with vitamin A, or more often it's going to be from taking supplements. Uh, these compounds can accumulate and turn your skin kind of a yellowish, even orange color. Okay, um, and it looks kind of weird. Um, I don't think anyone wants to look like an Oompa Loompa, <laughs> uh, although it can give you a nice glow, I suppose. Um, but also if you keep doing it, if you really overdo it, you can ask, actually risk getting uh, liver damage and causing other problems in your body. So I really don't recommend, um, you know, going so far as to get some of these compounds that we've talked about today um, from supplements. You certainly can um, buy things like this. You know, again, like lutein is a really good example uh, that you'll see a lot in like eye health supplements. But you know, that's not really something I recommend for the general population, especially because if you get too much of these things, you overdo it. Um, these antioxidants can start to have the opposite effect. They can actually start to increase oxidation, increase um, the presence of free radicals, and we really don't want that. So just keep that in mind. Um, and again, although I, I mentioned some of the research that's going on around each of these, uh, as of yet, we don't have any evidence for treatment effects. So it's not like you can, if you have macular degeneration, um, that we would recommend you take in a ton of lutein to heal that, okay? Same thing with, uh, you know, cherries. You wouldn't necessarily eat a ton of cherries to, um, you know, if you already have heart disease, 
okay? More of this is going to be along the lines of prevention. And, of course, we know that, I mean, all fruits and vegetables are superfoods, okay? One is not necessarily better than the other. Uh, whenever someone asks me, oh, you know, which is better for me, spinach or kale, I'm just like, both, <laughs> eat them both, um, or whichever one you like better. You know, um, it's just more important to get a variety of nutrients from lots of different fruits and vegetables, lots of different colors, and once in a while, if you want to go for a novel, um, a novelty kind, I am totally down with that, especially since it can add variety and interest to your diet. Um, it's definitely more fun, I would say, to eat some yellow watermelon as opposed to, you know, the red watermelon that we're all used to. It can definitely definitely be something cool to to break up your typical um, your typical diet. So again. Focus on whole food sources as well um, for these antioxidants. Eat Basically, the moral of today's story is eat your fruits and vegetables and eat lots of them, and it doesn't really matter to me what color they are uh, just to eat lots of them. But, again, they're awesome. I love uh, trying new things. Kind of the striped tomatoes are um, my big thing right now at the farmer's market. They've got all sorts of heirloom tomatoes that I think are super cool. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Miss Diane. Okay, so thank you, Leah. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about some options that we have for um, adding some of these colors to our diet, sometimes in ways that we may not think of. And these are things that you can, oftentimes you can grow in your own backyard, or you could also, um, you could also look for them at the farmer's market, like Leah just mentioned. So the way I have the slides set up, I'm going through it in, in the rainbow, similar to how Leia did. And on the left-hand side of the slide, I have kind of the things that I usually think of when I think about eating foods that have that color. And then I've got on the right-hand side um, some kind of unusual or different foods that you can look for. So with red, obviously we often think of things like tomatoes, cherries, other very bright red, you know, usually fruits. Um, but there actually are there are a number of lettuce new lettuce varieties that are coming out and what i thought was really interesting about the red lettuce is that there are there's a very wide variety of the different types because usually when i think like of a red lettuce i think of red cabbage or something along those lines um but there are actually a huge variety of different lettuces that um are everything from kind of a hot pink color all the way to a dark merlot a lot of times the leaves are going to be green in the center and then they have the red coloration on the, the edges of the leaves. And lettuce is a cool season crop, so it's usually grown early in spring or you can wait until fall. And the red lettuce is no different. Um, one thing to be aware of if you do choose to grow red lettuce, a lot of times that color to really develop that really nice dark bright color, um, it needs that cool weather. So there are some lettuce that we can grow, you know, even through the summer, but they're probably going to be kind of faded looking or kind of sad if, if you choose the red varieties. So most of these are going to be heirloom varieties, although there are a number of new introductions. So that one in the very middle, it's called um, a flashy plant, and there's like a flashy butter gem and a flashy butter oak and a couple of others, I believe. And those are actually new introductions. Um, so those are not heirloom varieties, but again, they're just, they're beautiful, I think. I really like the splotchy ones. Um, and again, there's, there's a lot of variety with the lettuce, so there's a variety of times until they're ready to harvest, a variety of different habits, so you can find dwarf or standard, loose leaf, things like that. Um, and like I said, that color does often require the, the cooler temperatures to really develop fully. So with orange and yellow, uh, I often think of carrots or someone already asked about sweet potato, and that's where I think of getting those colors in our diet. Um, however, there are a lot of different places we can do that. There, um, there's an orange-colored cauliflower, and the, the center of the cauliflower, the part that we eat, is called the curd. And so this particular variety is called cheese curd, which I think is hilarious um, because it's got kind of an orangish color to it. And one of the nice things about colored cauliflower, and there are a number of different ones, is that they don't uh, burn as easily in the sun. So if you've ever grown cauliflower, one of the recommendations is that at a certain point you go out and you tie some of the leaves over the head 
and that keeps the head really nice and white and doesn't allow it to become discolored. Um, whereas these colored cauliflowers, you don't have to worry about that discoloration as much. So you don't, it, it requires a little less cultivation, which is really nice. Um, and then we also have orange and yellow melons. And most, most of these are going to be heirlooms. Um, and there are varieties that are both seeded and unseeded. And they tend to have a slightly different taste than the red fleshed varieties. I've heard it described as tropical, which I think is interesting because I think we all have probably slightly different ideas of what a tropical fruit would taste like. But they definitely have a slightly different taste to them um, than the red varieties. But they still have the traditional, you know, very um, wet and uh, kind of... Uh, um, squishy texture, that's a terrible term, I don't mean squishy, but you know what I mean, the, the texture of watermelon, it's got that lovely texture. Um, one of the drawbacks to these orange and yellow seeded, or orange and yellow fleshed melons is that there isn't as much variety in them as there are with our red melons, and so most of these are going to be the, the large sprawling type vines, so you need eight to six, or uh, six to eight feet for each one, and most take all season to develop. So hopefully at some point, some smaller varieties will be developed that have more of a bush shape or that, um, or that you know, develop in, in a shorter amount of time, so they're good for shorter seasons. But right now, if you want to grow your own orange or yellow um, fleshed watermelon, you're, you're looking at kind of a monster of a vine. And there was a question, how about cantaloupe? Yeah, I could see them having kind of a cantaloupey taste. I think that's a good way to describe tropical. These, but these are true watermelons. These are not crosses or anything like that. These are true watermelons um, that just happen to have less of the lycopene that Leia talked about. And other. Um, they're going to have other phytopigments that really shine through with the orange and the yellow. So with green, Leah already talked a little bit about green beans and how you can kind of keep that lovely green color when cooking them. Um, lettuce also is, I think, a pretty um, obvious choice when we're thinking about green vegetables. There are green eggplants. So the picture up in the upper right, those are eggplants. Eggplants are in the Solanaceous family, so the culture is going to be very similar to um, tomatoes. And tomatoes are actually a perennial, but they're extremely tender since they're from tropical regions. So we tend to treat them as, as an annual here. The seeds are really bitter, and so it's recommended that you harvest the fruits when they're young before the seeds fully develop. also means that you get more flesh because you don't have as much space being taken up by those seeds. And if you harvest them when they're young, the seed stays or the skin stays very thin and easy to cut, and then it's easier to cook as well. And something I think is interesting, uh, when I think of eggplant, I think of the traditional, I think it's called black beauty, is the, the variety that most people know. And it's that fairly large, dark purple, glossy fruit. It's beautiful. But why on earth is that called an eggplant? It turns out the name actually comes from white or off-white varieties that were grown in Europe in the 1700s. And the fruits looked like eggs, since they were small and white, hence the name. There is actually a, a variety called the Japanese eggplant eggplant. And it has small off-white oval fruits. They're about one and a half inches to two inches long. I grew it last year and it definitely looks like you have a tiny bush with little eggs hanging off of it. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, but in this case, we have green eggplants and they're even like the white and purple striped eggplants. There's actually a lot of variety within eggplant in terms of colors. And then in the bottom right, we have a brocco flower. And there are actually two types of brocco flowers. And both of them are actually considered cauliflowers, um, if you get into the, the botanically speaking. But we refer to them as brocco flowers. So there's a green curd cauliflower. So remember I said that you can have cauliflowers that have different curd, uh, different curd colors. So in this case, imagine a cauliflower, except instead of being white, it's green. And that's actually a broccoli cauliflower cross. It's a hybrid. And since broccoli and cauliflower are very um, related plants, they can hybridize pretty easily. So that's one. And then the one that's actually pictured here is called a Romanesco broccoli. And it's uh, crunchier and nuttier than traditional cauliflower, but oftentimes it's used for its, uh, its aesthetics. Because if you look at that, it's got this beautiful fractal pattern on the head. And so oftentimes you'll see that kind of high-end restaurants or in um, 
you'll find it in farmers markets things like that and it has a good flavor to it but it's also being sold for its aesthetic value so one concern with green fruits is it can be difficult to tell when they're ripe um, like with the green eggplant for example it might be difficult to know when to harvest those so the first thing is to know that they don't turn colors when they ripen obviously because if you're waiting for that eggplant to turn color it's not going to happen you'll be very disappointed by the end of the season um, and then also we do the, the kind of the squeeze test so when the fruits are fairly soft and when they reach the correct size then we consider that they are ripe and we can go ahead and harvest them so with blue and purple in the middle is that purple curd cauliflower again beautiful um, in the upper right, we have blue potatoes. Leia mentioned how much she likes blue potatoes. There are a number of varieties. There's a fairly new hybrid that was released by Cornell University, and it's called Adirondack blue. And these are considered to be a superior blue potato because they don't lose their dark blue or purple color during cooking or boiling. So a lot of the purple or blue varieties kind of turn a gray color when you cook them, which is not as aesthetically pleasing as that lovely purpley blue, but the Adirondack blues keep that color. Um, a, a number of the blue or purple varieties have kind of an earthy flavor to them, so they may not be the best for mashed potatoes, but they are very good roasted, and they also tend to make smaller tubers, so you'll get more smaller tubers as opposed to like the giant potato that you're used to seeing when you think of like a white potato, like an Idaho potato, you have this huge potato tuber. The, the blue potatoes are going to be on the smaller side, but the skin also stays thinner, so that's nice. You don't have to peel them, and you, again, you, you maintain that lovely color. And then in the bottom right, we have purple basil. This is actually purple opal is the, is the variety. Um, one thing I do want to point out, for any of you that, that grow basil, you may have heard of the disease basal downy mildew, which has become kind of a scourge in Illinois. It shows up almost every year. It's a fairly new disease. It first showed up in Illinois in 2009, and it seems to be here to stay, which is not encouraging, um, considering it can be, it, it tends to be lethal to the, the basal plants. And a couple of years ago, we thought that maybe the purple or the red varieties of basil might be resistant to basal downy mildew, and unfortunately, that does not seem to be the case. So, um, yeah, you know, if you are worried about basil downy mildew, there is some good news on the horizon. There are some new varieties that are being developed, but purple or red basil is not going to save you. One thing that's important to know um, with this purple opal basil is that it is a culinary herb. So it's beautiful, but it is also meant to be used in culinary applications. Um, one thing just to be aware of is that there are, you know, when we think herb, I tend to think cooking, um, but that's not always the case. And so sometimes you'll find herbs, and they can even just be different cultivars of something that we would commonly use for cooking that have been developed with an aesthetic kind of point of view as opposed to cooking. So, so for example, sage is a very common herb. Um, there is actually a purple sage as well. It's beautiful. That's also culinary. Then there's something called silver sage, which is gorgeous, but it has these giant, extremely hairy leaves. And that's why people plant it. It's almost like a lamb's ear. So it's beautiful, but you don't want to eat it because it's covered in fur. And that would be a little bit weird. So just be aware when you're purchasing um, herbs, especially if they're not kind of the standard traditional cultivars or varieties, make sure that they are meant for culinary applications if that's what you plan to use um, them for. And also be aware that sometimes these different varieties may be slightly different um, in terms of like their hardiness, for example. So purple sage I mentioned, it's not as hardy as regular sage. So a lot of times in our area we treat it as more of an annual as opposed to a perennial, whereas the standard um, like cooking sage usually comes back year after year. With white, we have a couple of different things here. Again, we have our white cauliflower, kind of the the um, variety that we're all used to seeing. Um, but in the upper right, we have asparagus. And I think this is really fascinating because this asparagus that you're seeing in the upper right, it is literally the exact same plant that you would get green asparagus from. So it's not that it's a different cultivar or a different variety. It's just that it's grown differently. So if you have any uh, house plants at home and they are maybe not in the best location in terms of sunlight, they get kind of pale and stringy. And that's called etiolation. 
um, which is just what happens when plants really are kind of searching for the sun. They can't get enough sunlight. As Leah mentioned, we need our chlorophyll. That's what turns our plants green, and that's what's needed for photosynthesis. If you have plants that are not exposed to light, they don't produce chlorophyll because they can't use it. And so in this case, these asparagus spears have been produced by mounding the dirt at the base of the plant, so the spears have to grow up through the dirt, and they keep mounding the dirt up. And so you end up with these asparagus spears that have no chlorophyll in them, so they're not green. Because in terms of, I don't want to say what the plant's thinking, that's giving them a little bit more, uh, it's giving them a little bit more maybe human characteristics than I like to think about, but the plant realizes that if it's, if it's, tissue isn't in the sun, it can't photosynthesize, and it's not going to spend the energy to produce chlorophyll and chloroplasts. And so in this case, you'll see white asparagus a lot of times in spring, um, and usually what will happen is the first one or two harvests early in spring will be done in this method of mounding the dirt up and then harvesting the, uh, the asparagus after it's grown to a certain point. But after a certain point, they have to stop doing that and allow the plants to grow kind of more naturally, because the plant is not producing any energy. You know, this white asparagus, all it's doing is drawing on reserves from the roots. It's not actually producing anything. And so if they kept mounting the dirt up, you know, time after time, that plant would eventually die because it's not able to get any energy or feed itself. And so you'll see this ha the, the white asparagus show up in stores and in markets in spring usually. And then by summer, we're back to producing the usual um, green asparagus. And the white asparagus supposedly is milder and a bit more tender than the green asparagus. It doesn't have that really strong asparagus flavor to it. Other than I kind of question why are you eating asparagus if you don't want the asparagus flavor. But it is also very pretty. Um, in the middle we have white strawberries. And there are a couple different varieties of white strawberries. And this is interesting, I think, because normal strawberries, the ones we think of that have the big red uh, berries, they actually turn white as they develop. So they start as little green, hard, tiny berries. Then they turn white as they develop. And then as they ripen, they turn red. Whereas white strawberries ripen without producing the protein that causes them to turn red. So they ripen like a normal strawberry. They just are lacking um, a, the, the ability to produce that red color. Some of them may turn kind of a light pink color if grown in full sun. But again, I just think that's kind of interesting that, that they're just like a normal strawberry. They just don't have the gene to produce the protein. And so some of these are hybrids. Um, some of them are just different varieties. Um, some of the white strawberries are supposed to have more of like a pineapple taste. So there's a, in fact, the picture here is of something called a pine berry, which is a white strawberry, but it has kind of a pineapple-y taste. And then again, we have our eggplant. I already mentioned the white eggplant. Um, this is one of the larger white eggplant varieties, but I think you can imagine if the if the fruits were smaller, they would actually look like tiny eggs. And one other thing I just wanted to mention, this kind of um, goes back to the white asparagus, but there are variegated plants. You know, for example, um, variegated mint is really pretty, um, but it tends to be less vigorous than the non-variegated mint. And this is true for a lot of our variegation. And it's just because, again, that plant is lacking chlorophyll, so it's not producing as much energy as a non-variegated variety. So it's just something to be aware of. And then finally, the rainbow. So tomatoes, you can find in almost every color at this point. And some colors do develop more in shade versus full sun. One of the colors I wanted to talk about are blue potatoes or excuse me, blue tomatoes, because um, those are one of the, the newer developments, and they're also, people seem to be very excited by them. And it's also very unusual for us to see a blue fruit, um, other than, you know, kind of our classic blueberries. So a lot of work was done at Oregon State University, where they developed a cultivar, and it's named um, Indigo Rose. The immature color is green, and then as it ripens, it turns red in the shade, or a blue-purple in the sun. And I believe it was commercially released in 2012, so it's still very new. Um, however, the color is limited to the skin. And so because of that, they, there is a slight increase. Um, there is a, excuse me, there is a slight increase in anthocyanins, but not much because, again, that color is just um, limited to the skin. There is also a genetically modified tomato, which has been developed in the UK. 
um, which has blue flesh as well. So it produces that blue color all the way through the, f the fruit. And those do have significantly increased anthocyanin levels um, compared to regular um, tomatoes. But those are still in testing, so they are not available on the market. And something else I thought was kind of interesting is that true blue tomatoes, so like the indigo rose, for example, they produce additional amounts of anthocyanins. So again, it's still pretty low when compared to other traditional blue fruits such as blueberries, but they are actually producing more of something. And then there are tomatoes that we call brown or black tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Susan just asked about that. So things like the Cherokee purple or the black crim. And these actually do not produce additional anthocyanins. The color is coming from the fact that the chlorophyll in the plant tissue does not degrade efficiently as the fruit ripens, which leads to an accumulation of a pigment in the skin. So on one hand, you have the blue tomatoes that are actually producing more of anthocyanins in this case, but they're producing more of a phytopigment. And then you have things like the Cherokee purple or the black crim that they're not producing anything, it's just that the chlorophyll is degrading in a different way and it's allowing certain pigments to show through. So again, I just think it's interesting that we get color from all these different places. Um, bell peppers, again, tons of different colors. In this case, the colors develop as the fruits ripen. Unlike in the strawberry, where the red color is produced as the plants ripen, with bell peppers, and this is also true with some of our tomatoes, the color has always been there. It's just that as the chlorophyll degrades, as the plants, as the fruits ripen, that's what allows the, the phytocolor uh, compounds to show through. So that pepper was always red. It's just that the green was masking it. And so as the, the chlorophyll begins to degrade at the end of the season, that red color comes through. So again, we have the difference between producing something extra and just some of our other color compounds um, fading away. And then with carrots, I'm really excited about these different colored carrots because I love carrots and I love growing carrots. And now I'm very excited because I have so many different colors um, that I can grow. So we have red, purple, yellow, orange, and white carrots at this point. Um, and actually the traditional carrot was a purple carrot. That was what carrots were up until about the 1500s. And that's when orange carrots became common. And I've heard this, or I've read this, I don't know how entirely true it is, but I've read that um, carrots became orange, like our traditional carrot became orange, because a lot of carrots were grown in, uh, in the Netherlands, and so the orange carrots were selected and then propagated um, as, uh, um, because of the Duke of Orange. There, or the Prince of Orange, excuse me, their, their head of state. So I just think that's interesting that potentially the fact that we have orange carrots instead of purple carrots happens to be because of what country carrots were really developed in, at least for European markets. Um, with some of the purple carrots, it's just purple on the outside, so like the skin and a little bit of the flesh, but the inner core is still orange. Um, there is a new purple cultivar or new purple hybrid called Purple Sun that's purple all the way through. And red carrots may also have that issue where they're red on the outside but orange on the inside. So you want to be a little careful like if you are planning on peeling your carrot because you don't want to strip off all that beautiful color and just have a normal orange looking carrot by the time you're done. And there is a question about the peppers, but it looks like Leia is probably um, responding to that. So I'm just going to finish up my part of the presentation and then if people continue to have questions, that's fine. We like answering questions. So I've already talked a little bit about this, but why does the color develop? And there are kind of three major reasons for that. You can have an overexpression of pigmented uh, phytochemicals. And by overexpression, that just means that the plant produces more of whatever it's expressing. So in this case, it's these pigmented phytochemicals. Um, for example, anthocyanins in blue tomatoes. So it's just producing more of a particular chemical. You can also have a lack of chlorophyll. Um, so we talked about this with the asparagus and the eggplant, and so and that can be due to the environment, such as the asparagus, or due to genetics with the eggplant, where the plant just isn't producing that chlorophyll and therefore it's not green. And then you can have chloroplast degradation. This is what happens as our plants um, senesce, as the season continues and it hits that point in August and September and things are beginning to die back. And so you can have things like the bell peppers or the brown or the black tomatoes where the chloroplasts, which give them that nice bright green color, begin to degrade and then other colors begin to show through. 
And one thing that came up in our in the presentation we did a couple of days ago, people were asking, you know, well, why does this happen though? Like not physically, why does it happen, but why did plants develop this way? And one of the reasons is that for some of our fruits, such as tomatoes and strawberries and things that um, the seeds are spread via animals. And so the, you know, the animals come along, they eat the fruit, and then they either scatter seeds all over or they ingest the fruit and then the seeds kind of come out further away from the parent plant. If you pick a green strawberry, those seeds will not grow because the seeds haven't had a chance to develop fully. So they're not mature at that point. So the, the plant doesn't want something to come by and pick off a green strawberry because then all that energy it's put into developing these half-developed seeds is going to be wasted. So instead, the, the theory is that the plants develop these colors or express these colors as a way to kind of catch the eye of birds and small mammals and bats and things like that. And basically, once the seeds are ripe, then the plant says, hey, look at me. Come eat me. Come spread my seeds around. I've got a lovely, delicious fruit for you. And so it's this idea that the plants have kind of developed to catch the eye of some of their um, animals that are necessary for spreading the seeds, but only when those seeds have fully developed. And that's what we think of when we think of something is ripe. It's that, you know, the, the, the fruit has fully developed. It's mature at that point. And so with that, I have picture credits for all of my lovely pictures. This is our contact information. Um, so you have my email address, you have Leia's email address. I think I can speak for both of us when I say email is probably the best way uh, to get in touch with us, but you also have our phone numbers. You can view past recordings of the Four Seasons Gardening series on YouTube, and the link is right there. And with that, if anyone has further questions, we're happy to take them. I'm just going to scroll back really quickly to our contact information in case anyone wants to jot that down. And there was there is discussion going on about the about how chlorophyll can degrade and so I think one thing to keep in mind is that like the orange pepper versus the purple pepper, those probably do ha those have different phyto compounds in them. But those colors are only expressed when the chlorophyll, which is in both of them, begins to degrade. And I think it looks like Leia took care of that question. So if anyone has any other questions, please feel free to let us know.